there has to be a space. There has to be a space because there are moving parts and they're moving with respect to each other. So if there wasn't a space, they'd all be moving exactly the same way and they'd be stuck together. But when there is a space, the lines of force still happen as we've learned in all of our other lectures. But the lines of force have to cross the air gap. It is still a magnetic circuit when there's an air gap in it. It allows for things to move. Sometimes air gaps are even used. Pieces of uh, cardboard or plastic are put in in order to reduce the total flux and that prevents saturation of the magnetic circuit. Some, often you see fiberboard, plastic, or brass inserted to produce an air gap. But that gap literally holds the pieces together. So magnetic circuits with gaps either literally have a gap so that the two pieces can move independent of one another, for example, in a relay or in a motor, or the uh, reluctance has to be uh, increased in order to reduce the total flux to prevent saturation, but the circuit has to remain together in one piece so a piece of plastic, brass, or fiberboard is added. In both of these cases, all lines of flux must pass through the air gaps. That means that the air gap is fitted in series, whether it is literally air or it's fiberboard, plastic, or brass, it is literally in series with the rest of the circuit. But as the lines of force go through the gap, they spread out. So gaps have two effects. So I'm gonna write down the effects of gaps. They are gaps, whether they're fiberboard, brass, plastic, or actually air. There are two effects. The first effect, is the permeability. So you need to know that in the air gap, you need to know what the permeability is. The second effect is area. By that, I mean cross-sectional. The permeability in an air gap is that of air or free space, which you know is four pi times 10 to the negative seven Henry's per meter. The permeability of free space is always this value. Air is as permeable as free space. Plastic, fiberboard, and brass are assumed to have the same permeability of free space. And the other effect is the cross-sectional area in the gap. So what happens is you have a magnetic circuit and say your magnetic circuit uh, for simplification looks like this. the square cross section and it's a long shape. And you can see I've drawn an air gap into it. What happens with the lines of flux is that they would be traveling along this circuit. But in the air gap, there is no uh, highly permeable material keeping them in. And we know what happens to um, lines of flux when there is no uh, highly permeable material keeping them in. They like to oppose one another. So as these oppose one another, they move away from each other. So you can see this in this diagram, that the lines of flux would be going through the iron, and then they are opposing one another when they're not drawn into the iron. 
then they get drawn into the iron again because it's a ferromagnetic material. So we remember that lines of flux oppose one another. So that's what happens in free space. And then they get drawn back in. This effect is called fringing. Fringing means it is um, expanding beyond the um, dimensions of the magnetic material. Let's look at this in cross section. If I were to take a cross section here, this is a cross section of the iron, I'll say A. Cross section A would look like this. Where it has, uh, say, a length times a width. Cross section A if it is rectangular. So let's say it let's say I cut this um, piece of iron that says iron pole piece and it I assume it's rectangular. That's what the cross section would look like. If it is rectangular it looks like this. If it is round it would look like this. I can't tell from the picture whether it is round or rectangular. Perhaps by the shading it is round. If we assume it's round, it would have geometry similar to this where we would call this a radius of the round cross section that I have cut as section A. Now let's cut a section called B. Let's cut a section in the middle of the fringing, section B. If I cut section B, let's look at the cross section B. If it were rectangular, if this iron pole piece were rectangular. And let's look at if it was round. If it were rectangular, it would have a cross section that is rectangular. Or as I drew here, special case of rectangle that is square. If it is round, it would be round. So where the fringing happens and there are lines of flux passing through air, it takes on the same shape as the iron that it came out of, but it would be larger because you can see that the lines of force came out. If I were to draw the iron in the background, I could do that and it would be smaller than the lines of flux that poked out in the air gap. So in each case, there is the fringing behind it. Now we make a mathematical assumption. Our mathematical assumption is that the amount of fringing is equal to the length of gap. Assumption, and that's a very important assumption. We say the amount of fringing equals the air gap. So uh, the air gap has length, let's see here, the air gap, if I were to measure it, 
it has gap length gap. So length of gap needs to be added or padded all the way around the original cross section. So this dimension plus this dimension must equal the length of the gap. Each side then would be length of the gap divided by two. Length of the gap divided by two. Down here would be length of the gap divided by two. Up here would be length of the gap divided by two. Therefore, in each critical dimension, for example, from this side to this side, or the length, you have, you have the original length plus the length of the gap. Half of it here and half of it here equals the final length. Original length plus the length of the gap. Critical dimensions are length and width, and each one has added the length of the gap. If it were round, then the length of the gap gets added or padded around the original geometry. So that means half of that length would be up here, length of the gap half of it and length of the gap half of it on this side so you can calculate the area of the circle however you want to but I think most of you use pi r squared so now r is the original length and you have added length of gap divided by two. So now it, the area would be pi uh, times radius plus length of the gap divided by two, all squared. So those are the two really important parts of uh, the effect of air gaps. First is the permeability, and second is the effect on cross-sectional area due to that fringing. Let's do an example. In this example, you have to find the magnetic motive force that produces a total flux that is given. This is the same uh, magnetic circuit that uh, we previously did in a lecture about series magnetic circuits. But now we're adding a piece of fiberboard or a gap here at point X and here at point Y. So let's go through this example. Um, in the previous exercise, we calculated a few things. We calculated that the resistance of this top section the reluctance of the top section, sorry. The top section is made out of cast steel. And the reluctance of the cast steel, sec steel section is 8.557 times 10 to the 5 amps per whatever. So this is given. And the bottom section, I'm going to exaggerate that gap. This was made out of laminated sheets. And it had a reluctance of 1.26 times 10 to the 5. So these are given. Now we have to find 
I'm going to say solution. We need to find MMF in this series magnetic circuit with gap. With gaps. It has two gaps. So what happens in this circuit then is we have a reluctance in the cast shape. We have a reluctance in the sheet shape. And the gap provides a reluctance, and this gap provides an a reluctance. So this is a series. Okay. We know that MMF or FM is equal to magnetic flux. times reluctance that is total. Or you can say magnetic flux times the sum of reluctance, where the sum of reluctance Where the sum of the reluctance uh, is equal to I'm very sorry about that. Total reluctance the reluctance of each part in the circuit. So the total reluctance is equal to the reluctance of the cast part plus the reluctance of uh, the sheet part plus the reluctance of the first gap plus the reluctance of the second gap. So we could write that by adding the two gaps together. But don't forget that there are two gaps, so you do need to multiply them by two. But the reluctance is the same for each of those gaps because they are both the same uh, dimension. So in this problem, we are given uh, flux and we have to calculate the sum of the reluctance. We are given the cast part and the sheet part. So in this problem, really all we need to do is calculate reluctance of the gap. So let's find reluctance of the gap. Uh, reluctance, we have a formula for reluctance and it is the length the, uh, the mean path length divided by the permeability times the area. Length equals um, path length. So we can call this subscript gap, subscript gap, and subscript gap if you want to. So um, this is the mean path length of the gap. So let's look at what this gap looks like. The gap, uh, the material has a rectangular cross section, and then at the bottom it joins to a another uh, piece with a rectangular cross section, and the gap is in between. The gap fills up all of this space. And the length of this gap then 
is equal to the thickness of the fiber board. I think it was fiber board, yes. So the thickness of the fiber board. So the path length that, again, you're going to have lines of flux moving through this circuit. These are your lines of flux. And the path length that they go through that is a gap is actually the thickness of the gap. So mean path length is thickness of gap. In this case, it's the thickness of fiber board. It should be given in the problem. It is 0 0.1 millimeters is the thickness of the fiber board. And if you want to put that in centimeters, 0 0.01 centimeters. So that's the path length. We also need to compute um, the permeability of the gap. But we know that fiberboard acts the same as brass, same as plastic, and same as air, as air. And so that would be 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 henries per meter because it is, has a permeability of free space by definition. Now let's look at area. We also need to calculate the area of the gap. If we take a cross section of this gap, I'll draw on a cross section. So I'm taking a cross sectional area A of the gap. And so I'm going to look at that gap head on. And it would have had a rectangular cross section. And let's draw the original ferromagnetic material in the background. The original ferromagnetic material had a dimension of 4.0 centimeters by 2 five centimeters originally. Since fringing occurs through the gap, we assume that we're adding the length of the gap in each direction. So we're going to add the length of the gap here plus here must equal the length of the gap. So 0 0.01 divided by 2, half of the length of the gap is on this side, and half is on this side. Similarly, this is 0 0.01 divided by 2 centimeters. So an extra note here. We have padded the entire cross section with a frame that measures 0 0.01 over 2 centimeters thick. So in this critical dimension of width, we have added the thickness of the gap. And in the critical dim dimension of length, we have added the thickness of the gap, half on each side. Therefore, area of the gap is equal to uh, length times width. So new length 
I'm new with. That is the old length. Plus gap it times gap a gap length times old it in blue plus gap length. Half on each side. I'm going to draw that one more time. We have an original rectangle. Now, because of fringing, the lines of flux poke out further than the original um, rectangle. The dimensions are going to be the original. 4.0 centimeters plus gap length, which is 4.0 centimeters plus 0 0.01 centimeters. Half of the 0 0.01 was from this side, and half is from this side. So that's 4.1 centimeters is our new dimension. This dimension used to be 2.5 centimeters, but we need to add the gap. So that's equal to 2.5 centimeters plus the gap length, half here and half here. Well, let's write that in. That would be uh, 4.1 centimeters, 2.51 centimeters. So the area of the gap should be larger than that of the ferromagnetic material. That equals 10.07 centimeters. Don't forget to square the centimeters. If you would prefer that in meters, that's 1.007 times 10 to the negative three meters squared. Now we have length, we have permeability, we have area. Let's substitute it. Therefore, we're solving for Reluctance of the gap is equal to uh, mean path length over permeability um, times area. Subbing in, we have 0, 0, 007 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared over permeability of that of free space times the area. And I just subbed in area for length of the gap. Length of the gap is actually with some unit conversions. You can solve and get 7.9 times 10 to the 4. Don't forget that your question is actually asking for a net amount of force. We'll have to multiply flux, which is given, 
by the sum of the reluctances. So the given flux is 1.2. times the reluctance of cast plus reluctance plus two times reluctance of gap which now we know And if you solve those, then you are, if you uh, put that all in your calculator and round to the appropriate significant digits, which is two, you would get 7.5 times 10 to the power of two amps or amp turns. Therefore, the MMF of this series magnetic circuit with two gaps 7.5 times 10 to the power of 2 amp turn thank you